good evening. And first of all, my sincere thanks to all those kind folk who have written to me after our 30th anniversary Sky at Night programme. I did appreciate your letters, and I'm answering them all as quickly as I can. I think it may be appropriate to start off the second 30 years of the Sky at Night by talking about the planets, and in particular, about their atmospheres. But I'm going to begin, first of all, with the Moon, for reasons that I think will become apparent in a moment or two. Look at the Moon with the naked eye, and you can see quite a lot of detail. Use any optical aid, and you can see very much more. You can see the grey plains we still miscall seas, and the mountains, and the craters. But everything there is sharp and clear-cut. And the reason for that is that the Moon has no atmosphere. And that was finally confirmed, of course, by the Apollo flights. Here we see the lunar surface and the Earth in the lunar sky. So the Moon is an airless world. But why? Well, we know now, because the reason is that the Moon is a lightweight world, it has only one eighty-first of the mass of the Earth, and therefore it has a very weak pull of gravity and a low escape velocity of only one and a half miles a second. And that's why it's lost its original atmosphere. Let me show you what I mean. Here we have three bodies of different masses, the Earth, Mars, and the Moon. The Moon, only just over two thousand miles across, with a low escape velocity of only one and a half miles a second, its gravitational pull simply wasn't enough for it to hold on to its atmosphere, and so the Moon's atmosphere leaked away into space, until today there is none left. Mars, rather more massive, with an escape velocity of just over three miles per second, has lost a lot of its atmosphere, but there is some left. Now the Earth is much more massive, escape velocity seven miles per second, and therefore it has been able to retain the air that you and I are breathing. And at this stage, I'm delighted to reintroduce one of our most regular and welcome guests to the sky at night, Dr. Gary Hunt, who is, of course, a planetary meteorologist. Gary, what about the evolution of the Earth's atmosphere? Well, we started with a primordial atmosphere, which we lost, and then now we have a secondary atmosphere, which has come from the volcanic activities built up over time. This atmosphere has changed, particularly as the human developments have become more apparent. But more, is, more serious now is that we, mankind, are probably polluting our atmosphere and changing our environment. So we're curious to know what our future climate is going to be like, what the future environment is going to be like. So we want to be able to look through the solar system to see if lessons can be learnt by looking at other planets. Indeed, finally, there are other planets in which we can live. They are our goals for the future. Well, we certainly can learn lessons, and let's begin with the closer to the planets, and that is Venus, rather nearer the Sun than we are only on average 67 million miles away from the Sun, as against our 93 million. And just about the same size and mass as the Earth. But when you look at Venus through a telescope, you can't see very much on it. In fact, there's a drawing I made some time ago, and you can only see vague, cloudy markings. And even from space probes, you still can do no more than see the top part of a layer of cloud, and on Venus, it is always cloudy. There's a dense atmosphere that hides the surface permanently. And that atmosphere is not the same as ours. And the space probe research has told us that the surface temperature on Venus is well over 900 degrees Fahrenheit. The atmospheric pressure is over 90 times greater than that of the Earth's air at sea level. The atmosphere itself is made up chiefly of carbon dioxide, which of course we couldn't breathe. And those lovely looking clouds contain a great deal of sulfuric acid. So Venus is very different from the Earth. And yet, in size and mass, the two are almost perfect twins, and you would expect them to have the same kind of atmospheres. But they don't. Gary, why not? Well, you've given, actually given the clue, Patrick, because Venus is that much nearer to the Sun. It is the Sun's effects which have modified Venus into its current state. Initially, of course, the Sun wasn't quite so luminous, but as the Sun's luminosity has increased, that sunlight has heated up the surface, removed the carbon dioxide from the carbonate rocks, the atmosphere has built up, trapping that heat, causing the surface to heat up more and more until it reaches its current state everywhere. You can't escape those high temperatures and pressures on the surface of Venus. In fact, if you could stand on the surface of Venus, it'd be like a very heavily overcast day, because just a small trace of sunlight gets there. But here is an example of what we call the greenhouse effect, although I will add greenhouses don't actually behave like this, of pollution that has run away, out of control. And it must be a lesson, the sort of things that could happen on the Earth, Perhaps only our oceans will prevent us reaching another Venus. Well, certainly Venus is not a very welcoming kind of place. We do have direct pictures from the surface sent back by the Russian probes. And look at that part of the spacecraft. And there are the rocks on the surface of Venus actually glowing orange under the intense heat. 
a whole range of different sizes and obviously a lot of geological activity taking place on the surface of Venus. And I think it's interesting it isn't smooth in spite of the high temperatures and pressures. And we do know from radar observations that there are evidence of one or two small craters, a few have been seen. So clearly this indicates, as we said, the atmosphere has built up slowly with time, indeed as the sun has changed over geological time. And what about volcanoes, I wonder? This is an impression by Paul Doherty, but I just wonder whether the surface of Venus really is like that. Well, there certainly are volcanoes, they've been mapped, and whether they're active, of course, is, is quite a, a matter for debate at the present time. But certainly we know the sulfur dark side amount of the, of the Venus atmosphere is changing. That links to the sulfuric acid clouds, the yellowish tint that we know is present. So there's evidence, perhaps, that the Venus volcanoes could be active, that's something we want to monitor in the future. But certainly when you look at Venus, that is the only hell we've found in the solar system, an indication of the dangers of pollution when it's out of control. Well, let's look further afield then. We needn't have paused long, I think, on the innermost planet, Mercury, which has no atmosphere and is pretty small. But then come to the first planet beyond the Earth's orbit, and that, of course, is the red world, Mars. And with the telescope there, you can see surface features upon Mars. The grey patches were once thought wrongly to be old seabeds filled with vegetation, the red deserts and the white caps at the poles. And we have close-range views. This one was taken from a Viking probe as it approached Mars. There again, we see the white polar caps, the dark areas, and those blobs are, in fact, huge volcanoes volcanoes, or whether they're active or not, is quite another matter. I think most people consider that they're not. Now, Mars does have an atmosphere. As I say, escape velocity just over three miles per second, and that's enough to hang on to an appreciable atmosphere, made up again chiefly of carbon dioxide, although not dense enough to produce the kind of greenhouse effect you get on Venus. And, uh, in fact, the Martian atmosphere now, we know to be a great deal less dense than our own air at the top of Everest. The ground pressure is below 10 millibars everywhere, and that's not very much. And certainly not enough for running water to exist on the Martian surface. But there is evidence of past water. And the Viking pictures sent back uh, indicate the presence there of riverbeds. Look at that, almost certainly a riverbed. And look at the area of this crater, Ute. Over to the left-hand side on your picture, you can see what does appear to be traces of past water activity. But, as I say, the Martian atmosphere is now so thin that no liquid water can survive there. So, what's happened to all the water? Well, in Mars does have a, a variable climate. We know from the Viking analyses that it did once have a thicker atmosphere. That atmosphere has escaped. But like the Earth, you could get variable climates occurring on Mars. The Earth, of course, wobbles on its axis when it goes around in its orbit. And in fact, the rotational axis for the Earth does, in fact, vary by plus or minus a degree over time scales like 25,000 years. And this has been associated with advancing and stopping, slowing down some of the major ice ages of the Earth. Now, when you go to Mars, which is much more variable in its rotational axis, that axis varies by plus or minus 10 degrees. So these huge excursions can mean that the, the, the polar regions can get much more sunlight or much less sunlight. So if there is material locked up in the surface, and when you look around that crater UT, you can see how the, the impact has caused material to flow out like a slurry. It suggests that there may be material locked up in that permafrost which could be liberated if additional heat could be there. But you wouldn't create a massive Earth-like atmosphere, a thin one, slightly more pleasant than we have at the present time. Well, we may be seeing Mars at its worst, but there's still enough atmosphere to support dust storms. Indeed, quite dramatic storms occur on Mars. And to get an idea what they're like, let's first of all look at the Earth, which we're very familiar with. This is the, in the Sudan, a massive dust storm which occurs very regularly there, mixing up material to just a few kilometers above the surface. But on Mars, the storms are gigantic. They cover the entire planet. They go to altitudes of 40 kilometers. So, as this particular picture shows, you see nothing. Now, that was the drawing I made with a low refractor. The entire Martian surface was hidden. So, when you go back to Mars, then, with future technologies, we will be able to map the surface and, indeed, look to see if there are riverbeds underneath by using new radar techniques. And, and the grey section of the picture shows, in this picture looking at the Sahara, Beneath the sand, six meters below the surface, riverbeds in our own Sahara Desert, which we think at the moment to be a very unpleasant place. So these uh, uh, sort of analyses will give us an indication of what the whole of Mars is like and indications of past climate. Well, we know what the Martian surface looks like. We've got that from the land, the probes that were landed there. Look at those Martian rocks. And I just wonder whether there is liquid water below those rocks. There's certainly permafrost. Well, certainly the, what I think this is indicating is the need for a much more concerted effort towards Mars exploration. And in fact, the seeds have been sown by, in fact, a mission that's coming out very shortly with the Russians. This, in fact, is a model of the Russian Phobos uh, probes that are coming up. 
They're putting one of probe down onto Phobos itself, and then there's going to be an orbiter around Mars to study the Martian environment and look at the planet. And this is the start of a whole set of missions to Mars. The Americans are flying climate missions in the 90s, and perhaps we'll even see soil sample returns, as much as a few kilograms coming back, Perhaps they should be analysed in Earth orbit first to make sure they, they wouldn't endanger our own environment. So our chance to look at past climates, the place to go is Mars. Well, there's going to be plenty to occupy us on the sky at night in the coming years. But let's look now beyond Mars, beyond the asteroid belt, and then we come to the giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, which are very different from the Earth. And when we look at them, we are seeing gaseous surfaces, and here we have Jupiter, Saturn and Uranus all together. I think the first thing that strikes you is how colourful they are very very colorful planets giant planets going from the rich reds and browns and whites of of jupiter right up to the sort of the blue more uniform of uranus they differ from the inner planets in the sense you're looking at primordial objects these have atmospheres rather like planets had when they began hydrogen and helium and then other exotic things like methane and ammonia and their subsequent derivatives so these are the early atmospheres and will give us clues to how planets developed and plenty of activity. Think of Jupiter's red spots, now known to be a kind of whirling storm, and there's a lovely Voyager picture of it. And I think the thing that strikes you about this picture is the emissive state of the planet, how the, the red spot and the white clouds around it don't seem to mix. And even when you look at the very, very active weather systems that occur on Jupiter, and all the whirls and swirls that are taking place, the very rapid equatorial plumes and the red spot rotating, what thing that you notice is that the white clouds, the ammonia clouds, remain very different from the red and the brown clouds around them. They don't seem to mix up together. So although you have chemistry and dynamics working together, they don't seem to change the basic colorations. And a great deal of what one says about Jupiter also applies to Saturn. And again, we're seeing a gaseous surface there. And there are very violent wind speeds. And this ribbon feature you see in the Saturn picture is an example of a major jet stream on either side will form the highs and lows which are familiar to all our descriptions of weather from the Earth and beyond. But once more you see that the colours don't mix. That is a peculiar situation for which we yet, Patrick, don't really have an answer. We've got to remember that the giant planets are so different from the inner planets in their makeup. In a cross section, you can see, for example, that the, the centre of Jupiter and Saturn probably is iron silicate, surrounded by liquid metallic hydrogen and liquid molecular hydrogen. And what we are actually seeing telescopically is the top of the hydrogen-rich atmosphere. So it's not entirely clear-cut uh, which is atmosphere and which you can regard as planet. Well, in some ways, you think of it as an orange, and the, sort of the dirt on the skin on the orange is perhaps the, the weather systems. And what you see as you go down through the planet is a change of phase into the electric conducting part. And really these super planets are really failed stars because Jupiter and Saturn and indeed Neptune do give out more heat than they receive and that makes them star-like and affect their own environment and obviously their weather systems too. And of course they do have their own satellite families and some of these satellites are quite large. In the case of Jupiter there are four big satellites Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto, of which three are larger than our moon, and one, Ganymede, is actually larger than the planet Mercury. Oh, well, what about atmospheres there? Well, at first sight, when you see their size, you say, well, gosh, they must all have uh, atmospheres. But in fact, none of them do except one, Io. And that's a very strange atmosphere as well, because Io is stretched and squeezed by the presence of Europa and Jupiter. And what creates its very thin atmosphere is the extensive volcanic activity, of which this is an example, squirting up sulfur dioxide, dust, and sulfur into, into the atmosphere. And it produces a very, very tenuous atmosphere around a very strange satellite, which is, looks very much like the largest pizza in the solar system. Also probably the most lethal world in the solar system because it's so close to Jupiter's radiation zones. So let's move out now to the next planet, Saturn. And I think there we have the most fascinating of all satellites, and that is Titan. And there's the best Voyager 1 picture of it. And you can see nothing apart from a kind of orange layer because Titan has a dense atmosphere. And I don't think we expected that when Voyager went there, Gary. Well, certainly not. But although this may not be a very exciting picture, Titan is fascinating. It's a nitrogen atmosphere, the only other one being our own. And it has a lot of very exotic materials. It has methane, and it has the derivatives, hydrogen cyanide, propane, acetylene. Now, that may sound like a terrible set of things to have in an atmosphere, but just think of the chemistry. This is the basic set of materials, the building blocks that we thought was in an Earth-like planet. So here, in the cold outer reaches of the solar system, we have the Earth in deep freeze in the form of Titan. Of course, Titan's quite big. It's bigger than our moon. That's certainly true, but in fact, Titan also loses a bit of its atmosphere as well. And this is the hydrogen that escapes from the breakup of the methane. 
In fact, as Titan moves in orbit around Saturn, it's spinning off that hydrogen into a sort of a donut, which is replenished as the years go by. There's enough material there to replenish the atmosphere with the hydrogen. In fact, Titan is an example, not only of the Earth in deep freeze, but of a recycled atmosphere. I wonder what the surface of Titan is like. Is it going to be anything like this impression with clouds and Saturn shining dimly through? I just wonder. I'm not sure that Saturn will be seen, but certainly there's a chance of oceans, of ethane, and perhaps other exotic materials too, and solid areas as well. So when a probe gets there, perhaps in the next century, we'll have to be able to, to float as well as move around on more solid material. We've got to wait, I'm afraid, for that one. Well, beyond Saturn, Uranus, well, Uranus has been bypassed, and then we come on to the outermost giant planet, which is Neptune. And from the Earth, all you can see on Neptune is a pale bluish disk with no markings at all. That was a drawing made some time ago with a big telescope. You may not see anything at perhaps the visible wavelengths, Patrick, but if you go out to longer wavelengths and look through methane bands, you actually can see some features. And this particular telescopic observation shows two white cloud blobs. You may think, well, that's not very exciting, but Remember, we saw almost nothing in terms of Uranus. This does mean that there's going to be definite cloud features to be seen at Neptune. And there, of course, the chance will be very shortly with the Voyager flyby. And as Voyager moves in its incredible trajectory over the North Pole of Neptune, very close, missing hopefully those ring arcs, it will get the most important information about Neptune and on to see Triton, a chance to see perhaps another Earth-like planet, since we think there may be a nitrogen atmosphere, and perhaps this time, Patrick, we may see clouds and the surface as well. Well, we should know that in August 1989, which is when Voyager 2 gets there. So this will be the m most amazing follow-on to a mission which this year we celebrate 10 years of its launch and will give us then the other piece of information of understanding the atmospheres of all the planets in our solar system. At the moment, Neptune is the outermost known planet. Pluto is actually closer into the sun and will remain so till 1999. But Pluto's turned out to be smaller than the moon with a very low escape velocity, so I wouldn't expect very much in the way of an atmosphere there. No, I think that both Pluto and, and Charon will probably have icy surfaces, so I don't think we'll find very at major atmospheres there. They're more like the satellites we've found throughout the outer solar system. Well, in the solar system, we have atmospheres of various kinds. What about generally summing up, Gary? Well, think of what our goal was. Our goal really was to try to understand were there any other atmospheres like the Earth? The answer is no. Titan is the nearest, but it's very much the Earth in deep freeze. Are there environments that we can live on? The answer is no again. And it's clearly indicated that looking certainly at Venus uh, and Mars also, how pollution and climatic changes can alter the environment. So it's given us a lot of information about the, the Earth and the sort of changes that can affect the Earth in the future and the other planets, particularly with Titan, the way in which atmospheres evolve. So this has been very valuable research and exploration. We've talked about the sun in the past. What about the sun in the future? It won't last forever as it is now. How will that affect the various atmospheres? The answer, catastrophically, because the sun is going to swell up, and in fact, in its red giant phase, will probably burn off most of the major atmospheres of the inner planets, probably even boil away our oceans too. So we will, in a long while time, like 4.6 billion years' time, have to go off and find somewhere else to live. And perhaps then the outer solar system may spring into life. That could be our new home. Well, certainly in our own solar system, there's no world apart from the Earth where we could live. I have no doubt though, that there are other Earths going around other stars where conditions are very much the same as they are here. Well, certainly that is the case. I'd be very surprised if this is the only solar system with one Earth-like planet. There's got to be others. And I'm sure we could learn lessons for how other people are getting on managing their Earth-like planets as well. I have no doubt you're right. But in our own solar system, it's the Earth or nowhere. And as you say, we cannot, in fact, modify the atmospheres of other planets and expect to turn them into second Earths. This will not work. And you know, Gary, I think it was Fred Hoyle, wasn't it, who said once that the Earth is just the right kind of world for us. It's the right size, the right mass, it has the right escape velocity, and it moves around the right kind of star at exactly the right kind of distance, and so it has developed a suitable kind of atmosphere. And um, if it were not for that, if we didn't have exactly the atmosphere we have, you and I wouldn't be here. We'd be somewhere else. And so, from Gary and myself, good night. Good night.